Genius Kids. Cultivating love for learning. Chapter 10. A Jungle Tale. It was 7 o'clock of a very warm evening in the Sioni Hills when Father Wolf woke up from his day's rest, scratched himself, yawned, and spread out his paws one after the other to get rid of the sleepy feeling in their tips. Mother Wolf lay with her big grey nose dropped across her four tumbling squealing cubs, and the moon shone into the mouth of the cave where they all lived. Augur, said Father Wolf. It is time to hunt again. He was going to spring downhill when a little shadow with a bushy tail crossed the threshold and whined, Good luck go with you, O chief of the wolves. And good luck and strong white teeth go with noble children that they may never forget the hungry in this world. It was the jackal, Tabaki. The wolves of India despise Tabaki because he runs about making mischief and telling tales, and eating rags and pieces of leather from the village rubbish heaps. But they are afraid of him too, because the Baki, more than anyone else in the jungle, is apt to go mad, and then he forgets that he was ever afraid of anyone and runs through the forest biting everything in his way. Enter, then, and look, said Father Wolf stiffly, but there is no food here, for a wolf, no, said the Baki. But for so mean a person as myself a dry bone is a good feast, he scuttled to the back of the cave, where he found the bone of a buck with some meat on it, and sat cracking the end merrily. All thanks for this good meal, he said, licking his lips. How beautiful are the noble children! How large are their eyes! And so young too! Word meaning Squealing a long shrill cry, their spies, to regard with contempt, scuttle, hurry away, noble, having or showing qualities of high moral character. Now, Tabaki knew as well as anyone else that there is nothing so unlucky as to compliment children to their faces. It pleased him to see mother and father wolves look uncomfortable. Tabaki sat still, rejoicing in the mischief that he had made. And then he said spitefully, Sher Khan, the big one, has shifted his hunting grounds. He will hunt among these hills for the next moon, so he has told me. Sher Khan was the tiger who lived near the Vangunga River, 20 miles away. He has no right. Father Wolf began angrily. By the law of the jungle, he has no right to change his quarters without due warning. He will frighten every head of game within 10 miles, and I, I have to kill for two, these days. His mother did not call him Lungri, the lame one, for nothing, said Mother Wolf quietly. He has been lame in one foot from his birth. That is why he has only killed cattle. Now the villagers of the Vangunga are angry with him, and he has come here to make our villagers angry. They will scour the jungle for him when he is far away, and we and our children must run when the grass is set alight. Indeed, we are very grateful to Sher Khan. I go, said Tabaki quietly. You can hear Sher Khan below in the thickets. Father Wolf listened, and below in the valley that ran down to a little river he heard the dry, angry, snarly, sing-song whine of a tiger who has caught nothing and does not care if all the jungle knows it. The fool, said Father Wolf, to begin a night's work with that noise. Does he think that our bucks are like his fat Vangunga bullocks? Hosh! It is neither bullock nor buck he hunts tonight, said Mother Wolf. It is a man. The wine had changed to a sort of homing purr that seemed to come from every quarter of the compass. It was the noise that bewilders woodcutters and gypsies sleeping in the open, and makes them run sometimes into the very mouth of the tiger. Man, said Father Wolf, showing all his white teeth. Ha! Huh? Are there not enough beetles and frogs in the tanks that he must eat a man, and on our ground too? 
The law of the jungle, which never orders anything without a reason, forbids every beast to eat a man, except when he is killing to show his children how to kill, and then he must hunt outside the hunting grounds of his pack or tribe. Word meaning Mischief, naughtiness, a light, shining, snarly, tangled, bewilders, to perplex or confuse. The real reason for this is that man-killing means, sooner or later, the arrival of men on elephants with guns and rockets and torches. Then, everybody in the jungle suffers. The reason the beasts give among themselves is that man is the weakest and most defenseless of all living things and it is unsportsmanlike to touch him. They say too, and it is true, that man-eaters become manji and lose their teeth. The pearl grew louder and ended in the full-throated hara of the tiger's charge. Then there was a howl, an untigerish howl, from Sher Khan. He has missed, said Mother Wolf. What is it? Father Wolf ran out a few paces and heard Sher Khan muttering and mumbling savagely as he tumbled about in the scrub. The fool has had no more sense than to jump at a woodcutter's campfire and has burned his feet, said Father Wolf with a grunt. Tabaki is with him. Something is coming uphill, said Mother Wolf, twitching one ear. Get ready. The bushes rustled a little in the thicket, and Father Wolf dropped with his haunches under him, ready for his leap. Then, if you had been watching, you would have seen the most wonderful thing in the world. The wolf checked in mid-spring. He made his bound before he saw what it was jumping at and then tried to stop himself. The result was that he shot up straight into the air for four or five feet, landing almost where he left ground. Man, he snapped. A man's cub. Look. Directly in front of him. Holding on by a low branch, stood a naked baby who could just manage to walk, as soft and as dimpled little atom as ever came to a wolf's cave at night. He looked up into Father Wolf's face and laughed. Is that a man's cub? said Mother Wolf. I have never seen one. Bring it here. A wolf accustomed to moving his own cub scan, if necessary, mouth and egg without breaking it, and though Father Wolf's jaws closed right on the child's back, not a tooth even scratched the skin as he laid it down among the cubs. How little, how naked, and how bold, said Mother Wolf softly. The baby was pushing his way between the cubs to get close to the warm hide. So this is a man's cub. Now, was there ever a wolf that could boast of a man's cub among her children? I have heard now and again of such a thing, but never in our pack or in my time, said Father Wolf. But see, he looks up and is not afraid. The moonlight was blocked out of the mouth of the cave, for Sher Khan's great square head and shoulders were thrust into the entrance. Tabaki, behind him, was squeaking, My lord, my lord, it went in here. Sher Khan does us no great honor, said Father Wolf, but his eyes were very angry. What does Sher Khan need? My quarry. A man's cub went this way, said Sher Khan. Its parents have run off. Give it to me. Word meaning. Manji, suffering from mangi, muttering, speaking indistinctly in low tune. Twitching, pulled with a jerk, boast, an expression of self-praise. He will frighten every head of game within ten miles, and I, I have to kill for two, these days. His mother did not call him Lungri, the lame one, for nothing, said Mother Wolf quietly. He has been lame in one foot from his birth. That is why he has only killed cattle. Now the villagers of the Vangunga are angry with him and he has come here to make our villagers angry. Sher Khan had jumped at a woodcutter's campfire, as Father Wolf had said, and was furious from the pain of his burnt feet. 
But Father Wolf knew that the mouth of the cave was too narrow for a tiger to come in by. Even where he was, Sher Khan's shoulders and four paws were cramped for want of room, as a man's would be if he tried to fight in a battle. The wolves are free people, said Father Wolf. They take orders from the head of the pack, and not from any striped cattle killer. The man's cub is ours, to hunt if we choose. What talk is this of choosing? It is I, Sher Khan, who speaks. The tiger's roar filled the cave with thunder. Mother Wolf shook herself clear of the cubs and sprang forward, her eyes, like two green moons in the darkness, facing the blazing eyes of Sher Khan. And it is I, Raksha, the demon, who answers. The man's cub is mine. He shall live to run with the pack and to hunt with the pack, and in the end, he shall hunt you. Father Wolf looked on, amazed. He had almost forgotten the days when he won Mother Wolf in a fair fight from five other wolves, when she ran in the pack and was not called the demon for compliment's sake. Shere Khan might have faced Father Wolf, but he could not stand up against Mother Wolf, for he knew that where he was she had all the advantage of the ground and would fight to the death. So, he backed out of the cave mouth growling, and when he was clear he shouted, each dog barks in his own yard. We will see what the pack will say to this fostering of man cubs. The cub is mine and will come to me in the end. Mother Wolf threw herself down panting among the cubs, and Father Wolf said to her gravely, It's true what Sher Khan said. The cub must be shown to the pack. If they disapprove, will you still keep him? Keep him, she gasped. He came naked, by night, alone and very hungry, yet he was not afraid. Look, he has pushed one of my babes to one side already. And that lame butcher would have killed him and would have run off to the Vangunga while the villagers here hunted through all our layers in revenge. Keep him? Assuredly I will keep him. Lie still, little frog. Oh you Mowgli, for Mowgli, the frog, I will call you. The time will come when you will hunt Sher Khan as he has hunted you. Rudyard Kipling Word meaning Cramped, restricted, narrow, growling, to make a low threatening sound, fostering, bringing up or rearing, panting, to breathe rapidly or heavily. Like, share and subscribe.